Item number, SCP-077. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-077 is to be kept in Research Sector 861, on top of a 0.5 meter steel pedestal, in a 3 meter by 3 meter by 3 meter chamber, with 0.5 meter thick steel reinforced walls. The reinforced steel hatch door to the chamber is to comply with AH-37 protocol. It is to be guarded at all times by two level 1 personnel. A boom mic connected to a speech recognition system should verify that all pronunciation is within standards. A camera is to be mounted within the chamber to record any changes. Every eight hours, a minimum of two, but preferably three, trained D-Class personnel are to enter the containment area and, in a loud, clear voice, read the runes etched onto SCP-077 in unison. The reading must be performed by individuals who understand the full meaning of the runes being read, who are able to pronounce the entirety of the inscription correctly, and who are no more than 30 centimeters away from SCP-077. All personnel must undergo a one-week training session with Foundation linguists for pronunciation, reading, and dialect coaching. A minimum of 20 D-Class personnel are to be trained or undergoing training at all times. Trained D-Class personnel are exempt from termination until such time as they have been replaced. Foundation linguists are to remain on call in case of an unexpected rune change. Every new set of runes is to be transcribed into phonetic English, and provided with literal and idiomatic translations as quickly as possible. The cafeteria menu for Research Sector 861 must not include any potatoes or potato-based ingredients. Description: SCP-077 appears to be the top half of a human skull, engraved with runes, each filled with an unidentified black resin. The runes change every lunar month defined by the full moon rising above the horizon in Ireland, as well as at the winter and summer solstices, the spring and autumn equinoxes, and whenever a partial, annular, or total solar or lunar eclipse is visible from Ireland. If these engravings are not read aloud at least once within a 24-hour period, the eye sockets and nasal cavity of SCP-077 will emit SCP-077-1. SCP-077-1 is a luminescent green vapor, whose precise nature remains undetermined. It is to be noted that, although SCP-077-1 behaves as a normal gas in all other ways, it only occupies those spaces which are within SCP-077's effective line of sight, and does not flow into the space behind SCP-077, unless confined. Opaque, impermeable barriers with no biological content can provide temporary protection from SCP-077-1. However, attempts to permanently contain SCP-077 within opaque containers have failed, due to the artifact's production of sufficient quantities of SCP-077-1 to explosively rupture these containers. All biological material, with the obvious exception of SCP-077 itself, which comes in contact with SCP-077-1, is instantly transformed into a viscous, malodorous ooze. The ooze has been identified as the rotted flesh of potato tubers, Solanum tuberosum, which have been severely infected with the potato blight, Phytophthora infestans. One cubic centimeter of SCP-077-1 transforms upwards of 800 grams of biological material. Reading SCP-077's engravings has noticeable, if transient, effects on the health of the readers. These effects include nausea, cramps, headache, dizziness, incontinence, fever, skin rashes, nosebleeds, and fugue states. Effects intensify as the time between readings increases, and can become cumulative for individuals who read the engravings too many times consecutively and or too frequently. Readers have a 60% chance of developing an allergy to potatoes. Addendum 077-1 The artifact was recovered in the village of in Ireland. Locals had built a shrine around the artifact, where upwards of participants would engage in a nightly ritual. Fragmentary historical documents, retrieved from the remnants of the village church and library, indicate that the artifact existed as early as 1848 at which point in time it is described in highly positive terms, including Protector and By 1869, however, references to the artifact are fearful, resentful, and couched in euphemism.
Item number, SCP-089, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-089 is stored in a special shipping container at Site-36 and monitored for locution events. Mobile Task Force Mu-89, consisting of personnel with advanced training in linguistics, psychology, and tactical diplomacy, has been deployed in order to respond to such events. Upon the occurrence of a locution event, Mobile Task Force Mu-89 is to translate and interpret the locution so as to identify the primary subjects of that triggering, herein designated as SCP-089-A and SCP-089-B, then execute Protocol M-8, which consists of the following steps. 1. Transport SCP-089 to SCP-089-A's location and explain Protocol M-8 to SCP-089-B, and 2. At such time as SCP-089-B is prepared to voluntarily execute Protocol M-8, render to SCP-089-B any assistance as SCP-089-B may request in connection with SCP-089-B performing the following actions. Inserting SCP-089-A into the cavity together with inflammable materials, such as oiled wood or charcoal, then igniting them. The successful execution of Protocol M-8 requires the voluntary compliance of SCP-089-B in a sober and uncoerced state. Likewise, SCP-089-A must be conscious and alert during the execution of the protocol. It is recommended that SCP-089-B be restrained, although not sedated, following ignition, so as to avoid interference with the completion of the protocol, as the process is extremely painful and fatal to SCP-089-A. If SCP-089-B refuses to voluntarily execute Protocol M-8 in accordance with the aforementioned specifications, MTF Mu-89 is to explain the prospective consequences of failing to successfully complete the protocol and make every effort to persuade SCP-089-B to cooperate. If MTF Mu-89's best efforts to persuade SCP-089-B are unsuccessful, SCP-089 is to be redesignated as Keter Class, and Protocol M-9 is to be executed. The use of intimidation, threats, or mind-altering drugs or intoxicants in an effort to affect SCP-089-B's free will, and any attempt to complete Protocol M-8 without SCP-089-B's participation or voluntary cooperation, or otherwise other than as described, are strictly prohibited since these measures invalidate the attempted completion of the protocol and are known to intensify the severity of the attendant Type S event. It is also recommended, although not a required part of Protocol M-8, to cause the execution of Step 2 of Protocol M-8 to be accompanied by the sounding of horns and percussion instruments, as doing so may mask the sounds by SCP-089-A during the execution of the protocol. Upon a successful execution of Protocol M-8, the related Type S event generally begins to abate within seven hours. Description SCP-089 is a glazed earthenware statue, approximately three meters in height, depicting a winged, bull-headed humanoid with an open mouth. The front of the statue's torso is hinged and can be opened from the top to reveal a cavity, approximately 0.6 cubic meters in volume, and can be locked from the outside. The rear of the statue bears an inscription in a Canaanite language, possibly Punic. Dr. translated an excerpt of the text as Nightmare of Moloch, Moloch the Loveless, Mental Moloch, Moloch the Heavy Judger of Men. The statue dates from approximately the 2nd century BCE. On infrequent occasions, sometimes separated by periods in excess of a century, the statue speaks. The mechanism by which these sounds are made is not understood, and the mouth of the statue does not move. The statue's locutions are in a Canaanite language, probably the same language as the inscription, and consist of the name or description of SCP-089-A, a demand for Protocol M-8 to be accomplished, together with instructions for doing so, and a description of the attendant Type S event in figurative language. Each locution event is followed within a period of 3 to 11 days by the commencement of a Type S event, meeting the description given in the locution event unless Protocol M-8 has already been completed. Each Type S event is an epidemic, natural disaster, mass hysteria involving genocide or other massacres, 
or other event involving extensive damage to property and loss of human lives over a period of time that continues until Protocol M8 is successfully completed. In the case of each documented locution event, the attendant Type S event, while significant, is limited to a geographic area that does not directly affect SCP-089-B. This has, in some documented cases, resulted in the pendency of a Type S event for an extended duration of time due to SCP-089-B's unawareness of SCP-089 or of Protocol M8 or to SCP-089-B's unwillingness to undertake Protocol M8 in order to arrest the Type S event. For each locution event, SCP-089-A is a healthy, unblemished human infant or child between 8 months and 6 years of age, and SCP-089-B is that child's natural mother. In all documented cases, at the time of the locution event, SCP-089-A and B are each alive and healthy and experience a strong bond of trust and affection with each other. Following SCP-089-B's placement of SCP-089-A in the cavity and the ignition of the inflammable materials, SCP-089-A will burn and be destroyed over a period of two to five hours. Addendum 1. Memo to file from Dr. Garcia. While the role of SCP-089 in actually causing Type S events is unclear, Experience has demonstrated that the prompt and precise application of Protocol M8 is effective in limiting the damage that they do. Dr. Patel has speculated that SCP-089 does not cause Type S events, but merely anticipates them and provides a means to mitigate their effects. Addendum 2 A partial list of documented Type S events that were terminated by means of Protocol M8, including of documented completions of Protocol M8 that predate the Foundation's acquisition of custody, of SCP-089 follows. Date of locution, March 21st, 1788. Description of Type S event and locution event. The flames shall consume their houses, yea, and their markets, and their temples, and all of their dwelling places. They shall be destroyed. Type S event, fire in city of Outcome. Protocol M8 completed on day 29 after locution event. 66% of city's buildings destroyed. Date of locution, December 2nd, 1850. Description of Type S event in locution event. The false prophet shall gather the multitude unto him and cast them against the princes. They shall each of them be slain and their fields made barren. Type S event. Large-scale messianic-based peasant uprising in an undisclosed location. Outcome. Protocol M8 completed on day 1363 after locution event. Massacres associated with uprising and its suppression and attendant agricultural collapse account for several million casualties. Date of locution. November 23, 1951. Description of Type S event and locution event. The earth shall tremble and the seas shall rise and be cast against the earth, and the mountain shall vomit fire. Its voice shall be darkness and death. Type S event, earthquake and volcanic eruption in an undisclosed location. Outcome, protocol M8 executed within 31 hours of locution event. No tsunami resulted, although geological models had anticipated that one would occur from a seismic event in that area. No fatalities. Date of locution, November 7th, 1970. Description of Type S event and locution event. The rains shall scour the earth and sweep away man and his beasts and all his works. The deluge shall take them all. Type S event, cyclone in an undisclosed location. Outcome, protocol M8 executed on day 49 after locution event. Casualties from flooding, disease, and starvation estimated several thousand. Date of locution, April 4th, 2000. Description of Type S event and locution event. Data expunged. Type S event, data expunged. Outcome, ongoing. Protocol M8 not yet executed. Item number, SCP-2317. Object class, Keter. Site and personnel requirements. Under Special Order of 05, the following addendum is attached to the beginning of the file for SCP-2317. 
All personnel assigned to SCP-2317 must rotate out for one month of psychological counseling after two months on site. SCP-2317 is to be kept at an undisclosed location. All personnel assigned to SCP-231 will be transported there blindfolded from Site-19 by a route including no fewer than seven different forms of transportation, including but not limited to aircraft, automobile, underground tunnel, and removal of the blindfold during the transport process is grounds for immediate termination. Personnel assigned to SCP-2317 must undergo heavy psychological testing before being cleared to enter the site. Individuals must score at least 72 points on the Milgram Obedience Examination, be unmarried, have no offspring, and express nothing less than total loyalty to the Foundation. Normal psychological screening procedures against Axis II disorders are waived, so long as the Class D personnel in question has the mental capacity to carry out Procedure 110 Montauk as needed. Personnel who express sympathy towards SCP-2317's plight and or express a desire to rescue or sympathize towards SCP-2317 will be transferred to another project without delay. Any actual rescue attempts will be met with immediate termination. Personnel who have served on the staff of SCP-2317's containment team are not required to divulge that information to others. No official record shall be kept of the names of any staff assigned to SCP-2317, nor will said service appear in the personnel files of said staff. While on site, individuals assigned to SCP-2317 will be issued concealing helmets with integrated voice changers to protect their identity. On-site staff are not to remove said uniforms in the presence of other staff members. Off-duty hours are to be spent in private quarters, alone. Six Class D personnel are to be assigned to SCP-2317 each month for the purposes of carrying out Procedure 110 Montauk. Violent criminals are not to be used for this purpose due to the possibility of accidental fatality during the 110 Montauk process. Special Containment Procedures Following repeated escape and suicide attempts, and based on the failure of containment for SCP-2311 through 6, containment of SCP-2317 has been amended to the following. SCP-231 is to be contained within a soundproof holding cell, adjacent to holding cells for 6 Class D personnel, assigned for the purposes of Procedure 110 Montauk. Cameras will monitor every inch of the cell at all times and must be manned 24 hours a day. Malfunctioning monitoring equipment will be replaced without delay by psychologically screened staff. Doors will be magnetically locked, openable only by positive action by the control and monitoring facility. This includes all doors linking the main holding cell to those of the 6 Class D personnel. SCP-2317 is to be kept restrained to a hospital bed at all times except for the purposes of Procedure 110 Montauk. Hydration will be provided through IV drip. Feeding will be carried out twice per day through feeding tube by approved medical personnel who have not taken the Hippocratic Oath. Under no circumstances are narcotics, anesthesia, or other unapproved medications to be administered to SCP-2317. Procedure 110 Montauk is to be carried out at least once every 24 hours by Class D personnel. During Procedure 110 Montauk, at least one Security Clearance 4-231 staff member must monitor the procedure by camera at all times, although the sound may be turned off if the vocalizations of SCP-2317 become too distressing. Following the procedure, all Class D personnel must return to their holding cells, or explosive collars will be detonated. Description SCP-2317 is a female between and years of age, with data expunged. SCP-2311-7 through were retrieved following a police raid on a warehouse owned by an organization called the Children of the Scarlet King. 24 hours after the rescue, SCP-2311 went into labor pains, giving birth three minutes later to SCP- causing a event resulting in numerous confirmed casualties. Foundation personnel immediately took possession of the remaining SCPs-2312 through 2317 and, based on notebooks recovered from the cult, 
instituted Procedure 110 Montauk to prevent future occurrences. Addendum 231A Current Status of SCP-231 Units SCP-231-1 Deceased Killed during initial recovery operations while giving birth to SCP- SCP-2312 Deceased Killed during attempt to remove fetus of second SCP- Specimen Resulting in immediate- Event SCP-2313 Deceased Self-terminated following a prolonged period of distress Caused by implementation of Procedure 110 Montauk SCP- Immediately underwent a- Event SCP-2314 Deceased Attempted to administer SCP-500 Although successful in that all traces of SCP- Were expelled from the system Expelled remains immediately underwent a- Event Causing numerous casualties Including SCP-2314 herself SCP-2315 Deceased Botched application of Procedure 110 Montauk resulted in SCP-2315 giving birth to SCP-1 one hour later, which then underwent a event. Recruitment profile of Class D personnel was revised to minimize possibility of a second botched Procedure 110 Montauk. SCP-2316 Deceased Killed during escape attempt aided and abetted by a Foundation agent who have been exhibiting heightened stress levels due to prolonged exposure to SCP-231. Said agent obtained possession of SCP- and attempted to use said weapon to rescue SCP-2316 and SCP-2317. Said agent was killed in the resulting firefight, but a stray round resulted in the termination of SCP-2316 as well. Fetus of SCP-2316's SCP- then underwent a- event. In the wake of this incident, O5 level personnel voted by unanimous decision to amend personnel policies. SCP-2317 As of date undisclosed, SCP-2317 is successfully contained at site- Addendum 231B Text of missive by O5- Dear friends, It has come to my attention that recently, Certain rumors have surfaced regarding SCP-231. Due to the drop in staff morale, I have decided to address some of the more prevalent points. Yes, Procedure 110 Montauk is as horrible as you have heard, which is why only Class D personnel are authorized to carry it out. Yes, it does involve brutal- No, assignment to SCP-231 is not intended to test your loyalty to the Foundation your tendencies towards or anything else. No, SCP-231 is not a punishment detail. Yes, there are staff members who have been on SCP-231 and have successfully transferred out by their own request. No, not everyone who's worked on SCP-231 is terminated upon leaving the project. Yes, staff members who have been assigned to SCP-231 are allowed to take a Class A amnesiac before leaving the project if so desired. Yes, false memories are then implanted. No, none of the supposed methods for recovering or detecting false memories work. Yes, there are some of you who've worked on SCP-231 and don't remember it. No, we have not given up trying to save SCP-2317 but research in that field must be carried out with the utmost of caution. Based on the increased potency of each subsequent event, associated with each subsequent SCP specimen, there is a strong possibility that SCP-2317's event could result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. This information is corroborated in notebooks recovered from the cultists. No, putting the poor girl out of her misery is not an option. Neither is drugging her. She has to be aware of what is going on for 110 Montauk to work. One final note. The Foundation does many distasteful things in the completion of our mission, but our mission is important enough that the price is one we must pay. Containment of SCP-231 is one of our most dangerous duties, not because of any direct danger to ourselves, like SCP-682, but because of the danger that our resolve will fail 
that we will allow ourselves to either let down our guard due to sympathy for the suffering of an innocent, or that we will allow ourselves to become monsters through the performance of monstrous acts. Just do your jobs and save the philosophizing for the shrink. Sincerely, 05 Don't believe it when they say they're trying to save her. Why would they bother? They've got exactly what they want exactly where they want it. Addendum 231C Update 2317's emotional response to Procedure 110 Montauk appears to be reduced recently, despite proper execution of said procedure, increasing danger of SCP undergoing a event. Two options have been proposed. 1. Development of a new containment procedure with higher emotional response than Procedure 110 Montauk. 2. Administration of a Class A amnestic to SCP-2317, allowing for a return to base emotional response state. Said memory modification is to be administered during execution of Procedure 110 Montauk to maintain heightened emotional state following memory reset. Please advise. The doctor never tells his god which one he really seeks. Instead, he hides himself away, and quietly, he weeps. Dr. Addendum 231D Decision Proverbs 132 Carry out option 2 at the first available opportunity. Their God's own voice, he makes the choice, declaring with their word, In fear and pain let her remain, lest she be like the third. O5 Addendum 231E Aftermath Ezekiel 614 Option 2 was carried out. SCP-2317's emotional state returned to 100% efficacy. Dr. subsequently committed suicide due to heightened emotional stress. Will continue analysis of efficacy of treatment. The doctor's gun ended his run as he put it to his ear. As she was defiled, the pitied child, he gave in to his fear. Dr. Addendum 231F Continued Analysis of Efficacy of Treatment Revelation 1821-24 After some analysis, I have determined that it is not necessary to perform memory modification every time Procedure 110 Montauk is carried out. In fact, it is better to delay for some time before re-administering the agent. Analysis of Subject 2317's emotional response indicates that Efficacy of Procedure 110 Montauk seems to peak between the third and fourth performance of the procedure. The dread of anticipation of events seems to heighten emotional response for a time, before familiarity with the procedure begins to lessen the efficacy of treatment. My recommendation is that Class A amnestics be administered once a week during Procedure 110 Montauk. The calendar has been modified accordingly. Her memory, a fickle thing, the strongest shall endure. When her weeping starts to waver, their drugs make her mind pure. Doctor... Item number. SCP-282. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-282 should be kept in a containment locker, outfitted with a standard array of explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic high-level defenses. Personnel entering SCP-282's containment must be verified with a retinal scanner, and no experimentation sessions lasting longer than three hours are permitted. Description SCP-282 is a children's toy, recovered from the truck atoll in Micronesia. SCP-282 is in the shape of a set of devil or juggling sticks, apparently made from locally available materials. Historical and cultural sources show that SCP-282 was originally used by natives of its island of origin as part of an elaborate annual ritual known as literally translated as he moves to bring good luck for the following year numerous anomalies on the island alerted the foundation to scp-282's presence including exceptionally long harvest seasons several unknown species of fruit growing locally and reports by missionaries of strange lights and noises and packs of children who appeared identical. Full research on SCP-282's properties is pending. Addendum 282A Cleanup operations in the truck atoll have recovered large amounts of information, 
including a nearly complete set of use instructions for SCP-282. Operations in the atoll will be reduced, and despite apprehension from teams assisting in recovery of SCP-282, full testing as to whether anomalous properties can be recreated will continue. Addendum 282B Personnel of Level 4 or above may view Incident Report 282CB. As of any attempts to recreate the effects of SCP-282 are punishable by termination. All remaining information is to be classified. Data expunged. Addendum 282C Materials seized from a residence on the truck atoll resembled an incomplete replica of SCP-282. As the replica, seemingly in the process of creation, demonstrates no anomalous properties, it has been added to SCP-282's containment until such a time as we can ascertain its nature. Foundation-operated coercion revealed little information as to how or why it was created, but did indicate that more civilians in the area of recovery may know how or be interested in creating similar replicas. Whether the recovered replica is identical to SCP-282 is unknown. Incident Report 282-CB Personal Log of Dr. J. Garrison Date Undisclosed Attempts to recreate the ritual described in documents 282-14 through 17 are slow going, mostly due to the exhausting requirements of using SCP-282. First of all, it took us half a week to find anyone at the site who can actually use juggling sticks. For reference, researcher M. Munoz, a medical technology analyst, was ultimately chosen as the subject. Second, SCP-282 are apparently very difficult to use compared to ordinary juggling sticks, so we had to spend a few weeks working on that. Third, and most persistent and annoyingly, the instructions we have call for the subject to juggle with SCP-282 constantly for 36 hours, with a low rate of error and no dropping the stick. And that's the reason it's taken us two months so far. They can talk about dedication and project funding and results, but the stamina required is damn near superhuman. It's been suggested that we apply an intravenous drip of caffeine and electrolytes to maintain alertness, and I'm willing to try that. Hour Zero Subject stands in a 10 meter by 10 meter blast chamber that has been prepared according to recovered instructions. Among other preparations, subject stands in the center of a 1.5 meter diameter circle marked with native flowers, with a goat's head at the interior point. Surrounding this circle is a 3 meter circle marked with a mixture of goat and chicken entrails, mashed by hand with wooden implements. Outside of this is a final 3.5 meter circle marked with chicken feathers, chicken and goat footprints and ash, and a poultice of several herbs and human blood. One chicken skeleton and one goat skeleton have been laid around the room, outside the perimeter of the final circle. The subject, medical technician M. Munoz, with attached intravenous drip, stands in the center with SCP-282. Subject begins to use SCP-282. Hour 1. Subject continues with no major errors in play or reports of anomalies. Vital signs are all normal. Six hours already. He hasn't dropped it yet. I'm very hopeful that this time will be it. I watched through the plate glass. Get nervous every time he fumbles. Every time. It's gotten a little ridiculous. I'm worried it might be an effect of the SCP, so I told the standing guard, but I think it's more stress than a mental pull. Going to call a secondary observer in and sleep on the cot in here. Woke up. He's still going. Note. Instruments and testing chambers showed that subject's heart rate had increased slightly by this point in time. Hour 18. Subject notes sounds of laughter from inside the testing chamber. Outside observer notes nothing abnormal. Hour 23. Subject becomes increasingly paranoid, claiming that the experiment won't work and asking if he can stop. Encouraged to continue juggling, and at no point does the subject drop the stick. Hypothesized to be a stress reaction. Hour 26. Subject claims to feel a breeze in the chamber. Signs of strong winds are apparent when animal skeletons outside the circles are moved as if being blown. However, none of the flowers in the first circle are disturbed, nor is subject's play impaired. Hour 27. All lights in chamber abruptly dim. In addition, 
The outer circle appears to completely and suddenly disappear from view. Signs of wind, despite the enclosed and subterranean nature of the blast chamber, have increased. Subject is encouraged to continue juggling. Note: Later records show no electrical issues with chamber lights, hypothesized to be an effect of the SCP. Hour 30. Subject reports feeling cold. Sensors affirm that the temperature inside the chamber has dropped 20 degrees. Continues juggling. I nearly can't believe he's kept it moving this long. Obviously, the error frequency was expected to go up as the time goes longer, but he hasn't dropped it once, and the error rate seems to have decreased, like it's getting ingrained. Here comes the final stretch. Looks tired. I don't blame him. Hour 32. Second circle moves as if being blown inwards, then disappears entirely. Subject makes no note of this. After 10 minutes, animal skeletons around the perimeter of the chamber stand up, despite lack of muscle or connective tissue. Subject becomes unresponsive, muttering quietly. Hour 33. Final circle disappears, and lights dim again, until area inside chamber is completely dark. Observers note a voice exclaiming, he moves, before sounds of juggling cease, and a clattering noise is heard. Class 2 lockdown is ordered. Note: Further analysis through infrared camera reveals that at hour 3314, the subject's knees buckle, and after muttering loudly before footage is interrupted by several bright flashes, apparently only visible to infrared sensors. During this time, subject disappears entirely, and SCP-282 falls to the ground. Hour 34. Sounds of juggling resume from inside the chamber. Note: Infrared cameras show that a figure not corresponding to M. Munoz appeared in the testing chamber, recovered SCP-282 from the floor, and continued juggling while laughing quietly. Hour 35. Several more infrared flashes occur, some of which now translate into flashes in the visible spectrum. Containment chamber is very dark. At 3528 hours, side of containment chamber is ruptured by a sudden heat, measuring over degrees Celsius. Camera footage shows the unknown force proceeding to destroy obstacles in its path via obliteration, moving up an emergency stairwell, damaging stairwell but without compromising it structurally. At ground level, it proceeds to carve a route through the facility until the perimeter of site is reached, at which point it is no longer seen. All of the above take place within 4.7 seconds. Nearby personnel report seeing only a bright hot light. Note: Camera footage shows that upon compromising the perimeter of the facility, the force paused for several milliseconds, then disappeared, as opposed to exiting the facility. Infrared footage from the testing chamber shows that it is completely empty at this time. Within several seconds, light in testing chamber returns to normal. Subject has returned to testing chamber, collapsed on the floor, with SCP-282 nearby as if dropped. In addition, a fine layer of ash covers the testing room floor. Paramedic teams rush in. Subject is currently undergoing treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder and is expected to resume normal operations shortly. After Action Report From interview with Subject M. Munoz I'm… I'm juggling, right? Like I've been doing for the last, hell, whole day. Then everything picks up like I'm standing in a hurricane and I feel this thing. Don't even know what it is, but it was there and I could… Christ. Everything went black and I knew that I had moved, that I was somewhere else, because I knew there wasn't a floor or ceiling or those goddamn sticks where I was. Just nothing, really, and the darkness. And then it was there. God damn it. I knew it, that there was something else there, even though I couldn't see or hear or feel it, because there was nothing to see or hear or feel. It was just waiting there, keeping me there, waiting for me to do something. I curled up in this little ball, tried to make it not notice me, but it was there breathing down my neck the whole time. In the end, I just told it I wanted to leave. That was it. Additional data. Over in property damage was caused by Incident 282-CB, and containment of three separate SCPs were compromised. Because of this, current sanctions on experimentation with SCP-282 were put in place. Item Number 
SCP-360 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Foundation agents embedded in airport security and Sky Marshal agencies worldwide are to monitor air travelers and chartered flights for suspected activity related to SCP-360. Individuals suspected of attempting SCP-360 are to be detained, questioned, and administered a Class A amnestic. All items related to the activation of SCP-360 are to be confiscated for research. In confirmed cases of SCP-360 activation, Foundation response teams are to enact media suppression and prevent dissemination of knowledge pertaining to the incident. Flight crew and passenger witnesses are to be administered a Class B amnestic and given a cover story. Description SCP-360 is an anomalous ritual that ostensibly allows a single living human subject to ascend to a higher plane of existence. When performed at an altitude of 10,500 meters or higher, affected subjects emit a blinding light and a burst of high-energy radiation for several seconds, then disappear. The radiation dosage is negligible and does not pose any long-term danger to affected individuals. However, due to the altitude required for successful activation, SCP-360 has resulted in numerous aviation incidents involving both public and private aircraft. When questioned, numerous witnesses of SCP-360 activation events, particularly those identifying as devout religious adherents, have reportedly experienced auditory and or visual hallucinations, consistent with their religious beliefs. These have taken the form of seeing the affected subject with luminescent wings or a halo prior to disappearance, music with no identifiable source, religious iconography or imagery, or a feeling that they were in the vicinity of a powerful presence. To date, no individual who has successfully performed SCP-360 has ever been recovered. Addendum 361 Investigation Log Following thorough interrogation of individuals detained prior to a successful activation of SCP-360, it has been determined that in every case, knowledge of SCP-360 has been disseminated through a multi-page letter sent to the individual's residence. This letter reportedly contains self-help information, instructions for performing SCP-360, as well as a final message encouraging the reader to forward the contents onto other interested individuals. The vast majority of interrogated individuals had already forwarded the letter, but on one instance was successfully contained by members of Mobile Task Force Alpha 4, Pony Express, prior to mail pickup by local postal employees. The contents of the handwritten letter, which have been determined to be non-anomalous, are as follows. To whom it may concern, faith is real, but devotion is a myth. God exists. In fact, all gods exist. They are real, and their power is real, but their motivations are childish and petulant. Whether you believe in salvation, transcendence, or reincarnation, these are but hoops in the petty games that they would have you believe to be necessary. Real peace is found within you, and no priest or rabbi can tell you otherwise. When you learn to accept and love yourself, that's when the world finally falls into place and the truth becomes clear. Let go of the empty words pretending to guide you to true happiness. Let the world fade away around you and embrace the power within yourself. From those who have gone before to those who are about to come, we are here, waiting. Not as gods or angels, but as brothers and sisters. The remainder of the document describes two items required for successful activation of SCP-360, as well as the procedure required to complete the ritual. You will need a token, something from a loved one, a gift from a child, a flower from a spouse, or a toy from a parent, something that means something to you. You will need to mix a potion. The ingredients are simple but need to be precise. 50 milliliters of purified water, one crushed mint leaf, five grams of dried willow bark, 
3 milliliters of tea tree oil, 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. Combine ingredients and simmer over low heat until it turns luminous gold. 1. Fly. Lift yourself above the highest peaks, where the air is thin and the heavens are close. Angels and demons may be the messengers of the usurpers, but they have wings for a reason. 2. Hold your token close to your heart. Remember how you felt when it was given. Cherish that feeling and let it grow within you. 3. Drink the potion. Let it numb the body and free your spirit. 4. Repeat these words. 5. Be free. Pass this on to those who need it. You know who they are, and you always wish that there was more you could do to help. They will find you and thank you for it. That's a promise. Due to the continued occurrence of incidents confirmed or suspected to be related to SCP-360, it is suspected that additional instances of this documentation remain uncontained. MTF Alpha 4 is continuing to monitor postal services for instances and contain them as they become identified. Item Number SCP-361 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-361 is to be kept in a standard artifact containment unit in Site-19's High Value Wing. SCP-361 is to be kept in a cool and dry environment to prevent damage to the aged metal it is composed of and thoroughly cleaned after each use. Description SCP-361 is a bronze Etruscan artifact in the shape of a sheep's liver. SCP-361 is covered in the names of Etruscan gods and instructions for various religious rites, and is believed to have served as a tool for practicing haruspicy, divination using animal organs. SCP-361 bears a strong resemblance to the non-anomalous artifact known as the liver of Piacenza, with which it was originally found during the late 19th century. Both artifacts date to the 2nd and 3rd century BCE, to the province of Piacenza, Italy. SCP-361's anomalous properties manifest if it comes into contact with the sheep's liver, removed no more than three hours before interacting with SCP-361. When such contact is made, SCP-361 will vocalize, in a language and tone appropriate to the one introducing the liver to it, a set of instructions meant to achieve contact with one of the gods or spirits depicted in the writings covering it through a service it refers to as Harusko. If these instructions are performed correctly within a period of 30 seconds, SCP-361 will provide a new set of instructions. SCP-361's instructions will grow increasingly convoluted and or nonsensical until becoming almost impossible to perform under the given time limit. Failure to follow an instruction will cause SCP-361 to become inactive for a period of 24 hours. Test Log SCP-361 Test 361-A Stage 1 A sheep's liver is introduced to SCP-361. Vocalization Welcome to Harris Co. Your sacrifice is very important to us. For Tinia the Thunderer, please perform a horizontal incision on the offering. For Ida of the Underworld, please perform a vertical incision. For Maris, lightly cover your offering with the ash of a dead warrior related to you by blood. Stage 2. A horizontal incision is made. Vocalization. You have selected Tinia. For your weekly meteorological divination, Please singe your offering over an open flame for five seconds. For warning bolts, please place a green olive on the altar. For beseechments and beneficial interventions, please attach a written consent from the consulate gods. For catastrophes, please remove the head of an adult ox and hold. Stage 3. The liver is singed over an open flame. Vocalization. You have selected weekly meteorological divination. For your local forecast, please perform the seven sacred rites of Tinia while avoiding the anger of the mildew spirits. For forecasts for other areas, please perform the rites upon a boat of three masts or more. For a marital forecast, 
please consult with your local priestess of Uni. Stage 4 Researchers were unable to comply with the instructions in the given time frame. Vocalization No input was received. This sacrifice will be disconnected. Thank you for using Horus Co. Rasna's number one divination and deistic petition service for more than 2,000 years. The gods are looking forward to your next call. SCP-361 enters an active state. Addendum SCP-361-A In order to examine the limits of SCP-361's ability to alter the language and tone it uses to interact with its user, a subject with a similar cultural origin to SCP-361 was required. For that purpose, a request for interaction between SCP-361 and SCP-1510, the persona of which originates from the same general area and time period, was made and accepted. Test 361B Stage 1 Subject D-1510104 Wearing SCP-1510 Introduces a sheep's liver to SCP-361 Vocalization SCP-361 vocalizes in classical Latin, the language spoken by SCP-1510-1. The instruction is translated to Son of Romulus, speak the words thy father taught you, and your watcher will speak, his words carried by our spirit. Stage 2 SCP-15101 chants several phrases in Latin, later identified as an oath to Mars Gradivus. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Place the aspect of your watcher at his feet, so he might see your altered form. Stage 3 SCP-15101 requests an open flame. He is given a camping gas lamp. SCP-1510 places the lit gas lamp at the feet of the table SCP-361 is placed on. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Speak the duty of your watcher, so he might judge your worthiness. Stage 4 SCP-15101 speaks a Latin phrase, later identified as Mars Gradivus' oath, to guard, preserve, and protect the state, the peace, and the senate. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Show your watcher that you do not stand alone. Does he who guards your left carry with him your watcher's conviction? Stage 5 SCP-15101 requests one of the supervising researchers to enter the room and touch SCP-361. Request granted. Vocalization SCP-361 speaks in a different voice, still in classical Latin. Courage, Publius. This too shall pass. When Rust claims your soul at last, Valor will make you into Aeneas and carry you beyond these shores to rest among your fathers. The voice was later identified by SCP-15101 as the voice of the Persona's father. SCP-361 enters an active state. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.